testing, testing, testing. Oh, how's the volume? Is that good? Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me down here in Hobart. Um, I'm a bit worried now. I've got a few slides on probability. <laughs> Looking at the professor of probability here. But for the next couple of minutes, I'd like to take you on a journey. A journey to an ancient planet billions of years ago where under a faint young sun and in an atmosphere full of carbon dioxide and nitrogen without any uh, appreciable oxygen that you and I could breathe, non-living portions of the planet's crust got together and formed the first living cell. That cell divided and multiplied and diversified into myriad microbial metabolisms. And those microbial mats, or I should say those microbes, organized themselves into microbial mats which trapped and bound sedimentary particles that were present on this ancient shoreline and precipitated minerals like calcium carbonate and turned themselves into rock and thereby allowed themselves to be preserved in a fossil record. So I'm of course talking about the early Earth, but not a planet that you would have recognized, I don't think. The continents were in a completely different arrangement. In fact, the process of plate tectonics had yet to actually get going because the Earth was so much hotter. All of those radioactive elements were generating too much heat for that process to work. On the other hand, the sun was less luminous because that nuclear furnace had yet to get going. But luckily, we had a lot of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And we know all of this pretty much exclusively because of Earth's geological record. And fortunately on Earth, the oldest well-preserved sedimentary rocks are about four billion years old. As it happens, probably arguably the best preserved and most extensive pieces of the early Earth are here in Australia. A couple of weeks ago, I was out in the northwestern um, part of Australia in the Pilbara area with some colleagues from NASA testing Mars rover hardware. And some of my students are out there looking at these um, layered microbial fossils. They're called stromatolites. The one that uh, Brendan here standing next to is about 2,700 million years old, about the size of a rubbish bin. Pretty much everywhere you look on the early Earth in these environments, any, anywhere that was habitable, in oceans, in lakes, and in rivers, even in deserts, evidence for life is, is everywhere. And so many of us have been thinking, since life seems to have got started here on our planet, pretty much as early as it could, at least as far back as we can see, maybe it got started somewhere else, beyond the Earth. So can I have a show of hands? Who here thinks that life exists beyond Earth? Pretty much everyone. Okay. Who thinks that it's probably quite common in the universe? Also probably most people. I, I myself have a gut feeling that's probably the case, but I have to concede that the other possibility, the other school of thought, which is that life is extremely rare, is just as likely. We just don't know what the chances are. I mean, what unlikely confluence of coincidences have had to happen for that first cell to evolve from the non-living Earth. It could be such an unlikely event it's happened only once in the entire history of our planet, maybe the entire history of our solar system or even the galaxy. We really don't know. Has anyone seen this equation before? A couple of people, yeah. It's not really an equation, more of a, a thought experiment in that it was proposed by an astronomer called Frank Drake who was interested in figuring out or getting closer to answering the question of whether he was likely to ever come into contact with an intelligent civilization on the Earth. I'll use it today to give you an idea of some of the parameters that we need to better understand to learn whether microbial life might be common out there. And so in this uh, probabilistic argument, n equals the number of potentially contactable civilizations in our galaxy. r is the fraction of stars. Actually, no, sorry. r is the formation rate of stars in our galaxy. fp is the fraction of those stars that have planets. Ne is the fraction of those planets that have, sorry, the fraction of stars that have planets, oh, and Fl is the fraction of those planets around those stars where life evolves. And I'm bringing it up because for the first time in humanity's history, there has actually been some progress in this area. It's a really exciting time to be an astrobiologist. I mean, when I was first getting interested in this field, I guess I was in primary school, and I would walk outside into the backyard and look up at the beautiful Milky Way and wonder whether any of those stars had planets orbiting around them. And I didn't know 
and nor did anyone in the world, none of the world scientists knew, until we discovered our first exoplanet in the mid-90s. We now know of tens of thousands of exoplanets, and many which seem like they might be habitable, or at least they're orbiting at the right distance from their star to have liquid water. There's a heap of real estate out there. So we know the formation rate of stars really well. We know the fraction of stars with planets. Look up at the sky outside, pretty much all those stars have planets. We even know some of them that are habitable. And so we need to look at this next variable and try to understand whether life is likely to evolve from non-life. I mean, I have a sample size of one, we're in this room talking about it, but that's not statistically significant. We need to find a second genesis of life. So people do this in lots of different ways. Some people listen for alien intentional, unintentional transmissions through radio telescopes. Other people look for a different tree of life, maybe existing in this room in an organism we haven't discovered yet. So far, everything seems to be related. But personally, I think the best chance in my lifetime of discovering a second genesis of life is looking somewhere else in our own solar system. I like the inner solar system because we've got three rocky planets which all might have been habitable at some point. Obviously, the Earth is the only planet that's alive now. And if you were um, an alien somewhere else in the galaxy and you turned your telescope on the Earth, you might be able to figure that out by looking at the, the absorption of sunlight in the atmospheres of these planets. So if you look at Venus and Mars, you're going to see a big absorption from carbon dioxide molecule because carbon dioxide is the most common um, gas in those atmospheres. We've got probably too much carbon dioxide in their own atmosphere. But we've also got water, another greenhouse gas, and ozone, O3, which is produced from oxygen, diatomic oxygen in our atmosphere, which is kept there by living things. And so our planet's alive today. Venus obviously is hellish, Mars is cold and dead, but we have reasons to believe that billions of years ago, when those microbial mats were forming those fossils on Earth, both Earth and Venus and also Mars atmospheres and perhaps life. So I'm going to give you a very brief history of um, the investigation of Mars in like five slides. So 100 years ago we knew almost nothing. It was plausible that uh, Martians might exist on Mars. In fact, a lot of well-respected scientists wrote about this concept. Everything we knew about Mars we knew through our, what we could figure out by looking through the lenses in our telescopes. Schiaparelli famously drew maps of Mars. He got a few things right. He got the polar ice caps right. He got the crustal dichotomy right. There's this difference between the northern and southern hemispheres. But he drew a lot of detail, which other people picked up and ran with and popularized this idea that there was maybe a, a Martian civilization on Mars. It really wasn't until we got there with our first um, robotic spacecraft that we learned what it was really like. And the first spacecraft to visit Mars was Mariner 4. Um, here it is in construct under construction in the Spacecraft Assembly Facility at, at JPL, where I used to work, in 1964. And this is the map that NASA used to target the cameras on that spacecraft. The black polygons there are the areas that were slated for imaging. And the base map is one of these maps showing the alien infrastructure on the surface of Mars. So that was the best map we had in 1964 of Mars. But then in 1965, we got our first pictures of the surface. And we learned that Mars was, is a barren, inhospitable place, not even a blade of grass, let alone Marvin the Martian. And it sort of looks a bit like the moon. And so sci Martians in science fiction sort of have uh, never really recovered in popularity. But over time, we sent follow-on missions. We sent the first orbiter, Mariner 9, and then the first landers in the 1970s, mid-1970s with Viking. And we started to realize that there's a lot of evidence on the surface of Mars for there having been a lot of water there in the past, like a lot of water that's moved around. Here's an image taken by one of the Viking landers that shows this um, natural dam behind which water has pondered, broken through the dam, carved a channel, and been deflected around this crater, which must have been there beforehand. And even from, like, really zoomed out in this... I think the most beautiful mosaic ever taken of Mars by one of the Viking landers in 1980, we can see these huge channels carved by water which flowed down into this huge gash here. This is Valles Marineris, the deepest valley in the whole solar system. It's over seven kilometres deep. So there's been a lot of water moving around in the past. 
And when we got to the surface, this is the first image ever um, sent back from the surface of Mars, from one of the Viking landers. Uh, we realized there's, there's water there even, even now. Uh, this white stuff here is carbon dioxide and water ice that precipitated around one of the Viking landers overnight. But we didn't find any living things in the soil, which is why we went there with Viking. The soil turns out to be toxic. It's full of ble bleach, and the surface is bathed in uh, deadly radiation. So no life on Mars today. And NASA's astrobiology program evolved in the direction of following the water, looking for places that might have been habitable in the past. And so I don't know if any of you remember Sojourn. I barely do. That was a, about the size of a shoebox landed in a, a um, river channel. Then we had the Mars Exploration Rovers in the 2000s, and then Curiosity, this huge like nuclear-powered rover about the size of a land cruiser, landed in Gale Crater, discovered a habitable environment. So we think that crater, where Curiosity is still working, was the sort of place that life as we know it could have survived. If it had sneezed in that lake four billion years ago, life would have flourished. And so with NASA's new toy, uh, Perseverance, we're going back uh, for the first time since Viking to look for life but we're looking for fossil life rather than living organisms. And we hope to bring those samples back um, with a, a follow-on mission. Here's the, the, Curios the um, Perseverance rover, sorry. It looks a bit like Curiosity, but we've got a totally different uh, set of instruments. Our three main goals are searching for past life on Mars. More ambitious than that, we're caching samples with a drilling system that we're gonna bring back to Earth. And we're also supposed to prepare for human missions in the future. So we have a, a device that produces oxygen from carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere that we might be able to use as a breathable gas or rocket fuel in the future. We've got the first ground penetrating radar ever sent to Mars. And on the end of the arm, we've got two instruments we hope will help us with the first two goals. One of them, uh, Pixel, maps the distribution of chemical elements. So things like iron and sulfur and magnesium. The other, Sherlock, maps the distribution of minerals and organic molecules, organics that might have been produced by living things. And the maps we make are about the size of a, a postage stamp. Um, right, so the global scientific community decided to land in another crater lake on the edge of the Martian uh, crustal dichotomy. So this is this, uh, is, there's a strange difference. You can probably see this is a topographic map of Mars. The southern hemisphere is much older much more cratered and much higher than the northern hemisphere. So one of the ideas out there to account for this difference is that maybe the north here was a global ocean, and that's flat because that was once the bottom of the ocean. We were interested in this landing site because we can see evidence of water having flowed into the crater, carving this channel here, and bringing with it all of this sediment in a delta. Do people know what a delta is? What else? Yeah, a bunch of sand that's been, and clay been brought down by this um, water. We can also see a, a channel where water's flowed out of the crater. So we know it was full once in the past. So we hope to land around about here. Um, this is the sky crane. This is a spider-like robot that lowers the rover down on, on its bungees with retro rockets. This is a picture I took when it was coming together behind my office in 2016. We are using flight spares from Curiosity at the time. I helped to de develop this instrument, Pixel, the one on the... Um, the end of the rover's arm, it's about two meters long that arm, and we dangle that instrument about one centimeter over the rocks. That was the day we delivered the, the instrument in 2020. And this is what we hope it might look like if we found, say, a microbial fossil on Mars. This is a piece of Australia, actually. This is a, a stromatolite, it's about three and a half billion years old. And this is the map that Pixel and Sherlock make. I use this to calibrate the instruments, and so we get this distribution of chemical elements minerals, and most importantly, the organic carbon that's present in these, this layered fabric because it was once a microbial mat. So we attached our instruments. We were given some plutonium by the DOE. Here's the chunk of plutonium going into the rover. It's about the size of a fist. Provides enough power and heat for us. We put it all together in a stack and tested it in one of the biggest vacuum chambers in the world. This is at um, JPL. And then in the middle of this pandemic and with a US election looming and there was a hurricane bearing down on this launch site and we had a, an earthquake in the morning as well, um, luckily, <laughs> got, oh, luckily we got safely into space. 
And six months later, we were treated to this amazing footage for the first time we got to see uh, the landing of one of these systems. Oh, it didn't work. Let's try to go back and make that work. Because that's a cool sequence. It's going to work. No, that's a pity because you get to see the supersonic parachute deploy and the sky crane lowers the rover down. You might have seen this footage somewhere else and then flies off and crashes in a random location. <laughs> it's really cool. You have to trust me. Um, so anyway, we, did, we landed safely. We commissioned our instruments over about a six-month period. Um, mid last year, we deployed the first helicopter ever to fly on a different planet. This is Ingenuity, which was a, a technology demonstration we didn't think would last very long, but it's actually been really useful. It's following us around and scouting the area around the, the rover for us. It's still operating, even though it's got really cold at the moment and it's barely surviving there. We deployed uh, Pixel. This is the instrument, the parts of which used to be on my desk. It's really cool to see it out there on Mars. And we have a, a, an operations team here in Australia where every day we get data back from the rover and we sequence commands and usually while our colleagues in the US are asleep. We're also testing hardware in Australia and building software here. So there's a decent Australian involvement in this mission, as there should be, because we've got the, the rocks everyone's interested in. We've got a lot of the expertise. So I'll, I've got two more slides. The two main findings to come out of this mission so far, firstly, the rocks that we landed on turn out not to be deposits of, at the bottom of a lake, not the sort of place we'd find fossils. They're actually volcanic rocks that were um, created when lava flowed into that um, crater, which is actually really cool and interesting because if we get them back to Earth, we can date them. And then we can date the whole Martian surface using relative crater counting methods. So that was really cool. A bit of a bummer about the lack of fossils. But we, we kept moving, and, and this is where we are at the moment. We're at the base of this huge cliff here, and we're looking at the, the delta. And we think we're definitely looking at rocks that were deposited underwater. And we've just found a bunch of organic material in some of those rocks. And we've, we've taken about a dozen samples so far. Here's the sample we took on Monday. There's the hole uh, created by this drill bit, which takes a sample about the size of a pencil. And in um, I don't know, six or seven years, hopefully, we'll meet our mission with a follow-on mission which NASA just announced will involve two huge helicopters <laughs> based on ingenuity that will go and pick up our samples, bring them back to the lander, blast them off in orbit, and then bring them back to our labs at some point in the next 10 years or so. Um, so if you're interested, you can follow along. If this advances one more, yes. You can follow along on the um, NASA website. Pretty much all the images we take get posted within 24 hours. Um, and I'll be at, at the pub if you'd like to have a chat later on. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, I'd have, I have to look at our tech technical people over there. They it could, might be a bit tricky to go yeah. backwards. But, uh, you can find it on YouTube. Oh, right. <laughs> yes, over there. Wait till the mics get you. Because we have a live stream, which I want to acknowledge those who are watching on the live stream on YouTube. Hello, welcome to the Big Sport Festival. With the um, Mars thing, have you found any actual um, like debris of I guess you're looking at this have picture here. <laughs> we have, in fact, found alien debris. In fact, we're finding a lot of it. Here's some we found a couple of weeks ago. It's probably capped on um, a polymer from our own spacecraft. When the, the landing sequence that you didn't get to see occurred, stuff went flying everywhere. And it's all been uh, blown by the wind, quite strong wind in the craters, blown it up along the delta. And so we've got you know, all sorts of stuff. We call that FOD, foreign object debris. I'm thinking of all the conspiracy theories that were <laughs> associated with the moon landing. You just wait, there's a whole new suite of them ready for you, I think. Oh, yeah. Another question there at the back, thank you. Just wait for the mic, thanks. <laughs> Where are we? Just pop your hand up, there you are, yeah. Um, I'm here. Um, I was wondering if there's any change to the way you 
date things because of the difference in the environment on Mars, Earth to Earth. Um, I don't know how you date it, but do, does carbon decay at a different rate in Mar on Mars than it does yes. on Earth? I really, love that question. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot to say, but um, we don't have the capability to do radiometric dating with the instruments on the rover. We have to get the samples back. And there's a whole bunch of different systems we could look at. But since these rocks are so old, we, we wouldn't use carbon dating. That's only useful out to about 50 or 60,000 years. We might use something called um, uranium lead dating, which um, certain minerals lock in uranium when they form. And over time, that uranium will decay to lead. And we can measure the ratio and figure out how old that mineral is. Works really well on Earth. And there's no reason to think it should behave differently on Mars. Mars does have a different isotopic composition, which might be what you're getting at. Totally different composition of isotopes. That's how we know the meteorites we have that have come naturally from Mars are actually from Mars. Um, so we have to take that into account. Fantastic. Got a question over here. Thank you. If you ever were to find evidence that there was life on Mars at some point, does that bode well or badly for our longevity as a species? <laughs> that is so my question. Yeah. Yeah. Microbial life? I don't know. But if we do find microbial life on Mars, it stands to reason life's probably quite common out there because we have you know, looked at two planets, two out of two. Um, and if we don't, then either way, I think it's interesting for us as a species because... <laughs> Here we go. I want to hear from the... Uh, <laughs> Probability professor. I've got to ask the probability question. So yeah. you yeah. found life on Mars. Yeah. How sure are you that it's an independent origin? Or could it be uh, like one of these meteorites crashed from maybe we're all Martians from four billion years ago? That would, how it all started. Yeah, that. That would, that would totally be my next question. And so we'd have to figure that out. That could be really hard if the evidence is decayed and quite difficult to, to interpret. But one of the things we could do is to look at the handedness of molecules because all life on Earth uses left-handed amino acids and right-handed sugars. I think I got that right. And so if we found it was the other way around, then maybe it's second genesis of life. Very interesting, yes. Let's grab a question next to you right there. There's a lot of interest in Enceladus, um, one of the moons of Saturn, and they're wanting to send project, you know, investigation to it. Um, how do you think that's gonna sort of fit along with the time frame? Because you're talking about 10 years to get some material samples back from Mars um, and the mission to Enceladus. I think Enceladus is super interesting. A couple of weeks ago, NASA released its decadal plan, which guides the funding for the next 10 years, and they've cancelled their mission to Europa, but they've got a new mission, the Enceladus Orbi Lander mission, which is this awesome mission that will hopefully land on the surface and look for evidence of life. If they keep to budget and schedule, they'll launch in 2035, and I think they arrive in like 2050 or something. So. I feel lucky to work on Mars because it's a bit it's closer by. I think there was a question there in the middle. Thanks, Bree. Bree is the stage manager for tonight. Let's give her a round of applause. So I was just wondering, so obviously Apple's really amazing in terms of the different ecosystems that we can have. We have deep oceans and deserts and jungles, but then again, in movies, we get these like completely desert planets and ice planets. So if we were to say that there was life on other planets, what's the likelihood that it would be as diverse as us? Or would we be able to get these single biome planets? Hmm. Wow, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think we have the, the resolution or brain power to imagine such diverse planets, at least now as astrobiologists and exoplanet people, we're often talking about the average temperature of a planet. We're totally missing all of that amazing diversity. I think if we ever did find anything, it'd be absolutely mind boggling and the sort of work that people like myself do would be ancient history. <laughs> do we have any more questions? I think that's it. I've got a question though. I often wonder if, my thought experiment is if we, what if someone looks back at Earth as we are at Mars, yeah. at the ancient scars of a civilization <coughs> and the rivers that we live behind, beside and the oceans that once were, yeah. And imagine what we might have been I, from another planet. What planet could good, that be? <laughs> wow. Maybe a star that's older than ours, or maybe it didn't take them four billion years to reach the radio telescope stage. That's such an interesting question. There's a lot of real estate, but there's also a lot of time. As a deep time geologist, it's really hard to, to like get across just how much time there is. There's like 4,000 
million years. Mm. You fit all of com all complex life in a tiny fraction of that. In, in Frank Drake's equation, the last variable there is L, the length of time any intelligent civilization endures. It could be like 50 years we don't, out of, you know, 12 billion, who knows? Really insightful question, thank you. You also said something about, a, oh, oh, and we met, there were, what, three or four items on your to-do list, and one of them was, oh, well, we're meant to be uh, sorting out human mission to Mars, and it was almost like a bit of a throwaway. What's your vibe about that? Ah, sorry. It's JPL, we build all the robotic spacecraft, and we get a lot done. <laughs> Whereas the, it's a totally different director at NASA that does the human exploration side of things. And in some sense, we ride on their coattails with, with funding. But um, my personal view is that we get a lot more done for a lot less dollars with robots, and that's just gonna become increasingly the case in the future. Fantastic. Dr. David Flannery. Thanks. Thank you.